Welcome everyone to this Good Friday experience, a very unique uh, Good Friday experience. And just let me at the outset say here, um, uh, we, we want to just welcome everybody in and, and uh, have as many people join us as possible. And so I know we've gotten some requests from folks who are not on Facebook who are saying, hey, I'd love to, I'd love to be part of this, but I don't have Facebook. If you know someone like that, uh, I know Chrissy is going to be uh, including in the chat um, some instructions for how it is to share this with people who aren't even on Facebook. And so uh, thanks, Chrissy, for, for uh, uh, being our host today. Uh, but if that's you, and, and maybe it's not for somebody on, on Facebook, but you would just like to share that you're watching this and invite some of your friends and family, I would love you to just take a moment right now and share this post uh, with other people. If you're on a phone, you can uh, share it and you can share the uh, you know, the link or, or share it whatever way you choose. If you're watching on a, a laptop or a computer or a TV or a Roku or whatever you have, I'd encourage you to, to have this on the biggest screen possible. I think that's gonna be the most uh, enjoyable experience. Uh, but if that's you, if you're watching on a computer, just you can just copy the uh, web address uh, out of the, uh, uh, the top, top part of your screen there and paste it into an email or text message or however you wanna do that. I also wanna encourage you to get some supplies together if you haven't already. Um, and uh, realize this is the, the eight o'clock uh, live stream. And so uh, maybe some with small kids already have your kids to bed and that's cool. That's why you're joining us at this time. Also recognize that there are some families going through this together. And so uh, love you guys, with, especially with younger kids. Um, and uh, what, a, what a time to be alive. But uh, there's a little scavenger hunt piece of this and it's gonna be a meaningful experience. Whether you're a kid or not, I would encourage you to do this. Uh, to get uh, some coins, just a handful of coins, uh, a nail, some vinegar, red wine vinegar, something like that, uh, a rag or a newspaper that can be torn, uh, some bread and juice or crackers and juice and cookies and sparkling water, whatever it is that you have. We're gonna share communion together a little bit later. And then a candle and something to light that candle with. Uh, and I just want to say, to if you have really small kids with you right now, to use your discretion with those kids. Um, you know, the, we're, we're talking about Good Friday. We're going to be talking about some intense uh, stuff that Jesus went through. And so if, it, if you think it's going to be too intense for your kids, I would encourage you to maybe put them to bed and, and watch this on playback a, a little bit later. So go ahead and get those things together. Share the post. Uh, get your stuff together as we prepare for this. Uh, interesting Good Friday experience. And, and as I say that, I, I would just ask the question here, you know, why do we call this Good Friday? What makes this day good? Uh, because we usually don't call it good when we go to a funeral. We don't normally celebrate death. Uh, we mourn death. We question death. We fear death. Uh, we avoid death. We curse death at times. But we don't really even like to talk about death or think about death. In fact, many of us have built our whole lives around the idea of, I never want to think about this. I want to avoid it as much as possible. So we love life. And, and so we have games called life. We have cereal called life. Um, I, don't, I don't know the last time you've had cereal called death, unless you're a, a night owl. Maybe cereal represents death to you. I'm not sure. But it, it, so if we despise death so much that we don't even want to talk about it, we don't want to think about it. Um, why is it that we come to this day and we call it good? Good Friday. It's the day Jesus died. What makes it good? Well, I think we can find the beginning of the answer in a passage in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Paul says this, he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And I want you to listen to these three words. So that we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. 
And so we recognize that Jesus' death represents something bigger. And it rep represents something that impacts us directly. He says, so that we. I'd love you to repeat those words with me. So that we. So that we. You see, the things that Jesus went through on this day, they were not meaningless things. They were not selfish things that only impacted him. They were things that impacted us. And this is why it's good. This is, because this day means everything to us. He died so that we could have a relationship with God. He died so that we could be cleansed from sin, so that we could be whole, so that we could be forgiven, so that we, as this passage says, could be righteous, right standing before God. And so tonight, even though we're, we're remembering a death, we're, we're gonna stand between, we're, we're gonna hold in the balance, sorrow and celebration as we go through this time together. The Bible says that by his wounds or by his stripes, that's the, that's the sorrow part. And then it says, we are healed. That's the celebration part. By his wounds, we are healed. And so here's what I want to encourage you to do tonight. I want you to, to, to participate, all right? We're gonna, the, the worship team's gonna lead us in some incredible music. I would love you to sing along, even if it feels awkward there in front of the screen. Whoever you're with, whether you're with some family or friends or whether you're by yourself, Sing along, participate, read along. As I mentioned some of these scriptures, look it up quick in your phone or on your device. If you need to have a side conversation where you do some interpretation of what's going on for your kids or explain something to them, that is all good. If you want to participate in the chat, that's great. And to get us rolling in the chat, I'd love you to just put in here as the first couple songs play, what are you thinking about as we enter this Good Friday? What are you, what's on your mind? What's on your heart as we're coming into this time together? Good Friday, 2020. So this experience is going to be 45 or 50 minutes long or so. So I just want to get you ready for that. I would love you to settle in and it's going to be a really profound experience. So as the worship team leads us, would you enter that in the chat or just ponder it in your heart? What are you thinking about? What's God doing in your heart as we enter into this time on Good Friday, 2020? Oh 
beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders a shame i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought Thanks so much, guys. What a powerful uh, set of worship. And I'm just looking at these comments. You know, Paula says, have your way, Lord. Betty, rebirth, pure love from Kathy. It's just what we're thinking as we come into this Good Friday. Rob, I'm thinking about a new, uh, new start in life. Shalene, how much he loves me, no matter my sinful ways. Christy, the living hope of Jesus. Rick, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Oh, yeah, we're praying for you, Carol, as well. Lisa, his dying breath brought me life. Carrie, a complete gratefulness and feeling extremely blessed. I mean, just just good stuff as we come into this time. And so what I want to do tonight is I really want to answer this question, you know, what? why is Good Friday good as we look to what Jesus accomplished? And to help us do that, I'm, I'm just going to walk us through kind of the story from from Thursday night, from last night, Maundy Thursday, where we left off the story, and just walk us through the crucifixion of Jesus. And remember, last night we were celebrating that, that last supper of Jesus, the final Passover meal that he had with his disciples. And that meal is what set in motion the final dramatic events of Jesus' life. It was at that meal, at that dinner, that Judas stood up and he left the table and he went to the officials that he'd already made an arrangement with earlier in the week. And, and, and then the rest of the disciples leave that dinner and they go with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want you to see a picture of this Garden of Gethsemane. It, it's quite an incredible thing. Check it out. I remember being there. Kim and I stood in that garden and it, it's just kind of an eerie place. There are these, you can see there's these big old olive trees. Some of the oldest trees in the whole world are right there in that garden. And so Jesus went with the disciples and they were trying to, to pray. And that's where Jesus sweat, sweat droplets of blood. He, he was so consumed by taking on the, the wrath of his father. 
And as they're in that garden, they, they hear the clicking of boots off in the, the distance and they hear this mob of people coming toward them, of soldiers. And what I want you to do, hopefully you've, you've been able at this point to collect up some of these items, but I want you to take a handful of these coins. Just get a handful of coins. Hopefully they're pre-COVID-19 coins. So just get them in your hand. If you're watching this with some people, you know, pass some around or, or make sure that everybody has a, a few coins in their hand. But make sure everybody's kind of holding the, the, some coins as I make this point. But if you remember earlier in the week, Judas went to the chief priests and the Bible says that he asked this question. He asked, what, what are you willing to give me to hand Jesus over to you? And they responded and they said, 30 silver coins, hand, literally a handful of coins. And then it says Judas started to watch for an opportunity to hand him over. I want to read you a passage in Matthew 26, starting in verse 47. We go back to the garden and it says, While he was still speaking, that's Jesus, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him was a large crowd armed with clubs and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now that the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. And Judas said, the one that I kiss is the man, arrest him. And so going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Now just think about this moment for a second. Judas had been with Jesus from day one. He had seen everything. He had seen people raised from the dead. He had seen, seen the, the, the seas calmed. He had seen the poor cared for. He had seen the feeding of the 5,000. He had a front row seat to everything that Jesus was doing. And in the middle of the night, he sneaks off and he goes and sells out his friend for 30 pieces of silver. And he does it with a kiss. And Jesus knew that this was coming, but I still imagine him looking at Judas going, you, you, you were one of my guys. You know, you were on the inner circle of this whole thing. And you betray me with a kiss. And this starts off a series of events of, of betrayals and denials from the rest of the disciples. And they abandon Jesus and they all scatter all over the place. And, and, and Jesus is left to walk this road to the cross alone. And I ask you tonight, have you ever been betrayed? And betrayal only happens, like we only feel it deeply when it's somebody that we really love. So have you ever been betrayed by someone where you look over and, and go, no, 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 not that person. No, please, not them. I loved them. I, I let them in. Like, I don't trust anybody, and I trusted that person, and they turned around and betrayed me. Kids, have you ever felt this? Kid, kids that are watching, you know, you ever experience this thing where you tell somebody a secret and say, don't tell anybody else, and all of a sudden, you know, it's spread all over the school and everybody knows what's going on. Jesus knows about betrayal. And he walked in betrayal alone. And so let me ask this, as we hold these coins in our hands, what is the, the price of your allegiance to Jesus? Judas found his price. We don't know exactly how much the 30 pieces of silver are. It could be, I've seen estimates from a few hundred dollars to half a year's wages, maybe up to $15,000 in modern money. It's still not life-changing money. But, but when for you does it become worth it to walk away from Jesus? What's your price? And I just want to offer you a quiet moment here as we hold these coins in our hands for, for you to pray this very simple prayer. I, I just want you to close your eyes, bow your head, pray this simple prayer under your breath. Just say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my betrayal. I'm sorry for my betrayal. Would you do it this moment? But remember, we're talking about why Good Friday is good. And, and these three words are so key. So that we, because this is an event that Jesus did, just did for himself and for his own good. This is an event that Jesus did for us. And so here's what I want to remind you of. Jesus was betrayed. He was betrayed by Jews, Judas with a handful of coins. So that we could have hope. It's powerful. Jesus was arrested in the garden. You can put those coins down, by the way. Jesus was arrested in the garden at the hands of Judas and this mob that he brought with him. And, and, and Jesus went through a, a night full and a morning full of, of legal proceedings. He stood before the high priest. He stood before the Sanhedrin. He went before Pontius Pilate. He went before Herod then, and then he came back before Pontius Pilate. This is when Pontius Pilate said, hey, I think he's innocent. Like, there's nothing that, that I can, you know, convict him of. 
And he brings him to the crowd and the crowd says, crucify him, crucify him. The same crowd that was waving palm branches a week ago now is saying crucify him. And so Pontius Pilate caves to public opinion and he releases Jesus to be crucified. Well, what happens next early that morning of Good Friday is just dreadful. Um, Jesus was flogged. He was beaten within an inch of his life. What they would do to, to, to then people who went to crosses in those days, it was a common occurrence. They would tie around their neck uh, whatever the accusation was. And so he would have worn a, a, a sign around his neck that eventually when he got crucified would have been hung, hung above his head. And we know what that sign said. It said, King of the Jews. It was a mocking sign. He, he was being accused of blasphemy, of claiming to be a king and, and not actually being a king. And so they put a crown of thorns on his head and they mocked him. And about 8 a.m., the morning of Good Friday, Jesus began to walk carry his cross toward Golgotha. It's called the place of the skull. It's a, it's a hillside that, that looks just like a skull. At 9 a.m., the Bible calls it the third hour, they crucified him. What I want you to do right now is to take that nail in your hand. Hopefully you were able to get a nail out of your garage or workshop or one of the drawers in your kitchen or wherever nails might be. But I happen to be married to a, a carpenter. My wife is a carpenter. And so she was able to, to come up with these pretty uh, authentic looking nails. Um, this is probably what the nails would have looked like when, uh, when they crucified Jesus. But I want you to take that nail and just pass it around if you're watching this with some people or if you're by yourself. I want you to just feel the tip of that nail. Press it into your skin a little bit. Press it onto your wrist a little bit and just feel the, the, the sharp, sharp point of that nail. The nail that, that they used for Jesus would have been probably about seven inches long. I got a little picture of the, the nails and a crown of thorns. I want you to see them now. All right, so that's probably what it would have looked like. And, and Jesus was familiar. Here's the interesting thing. Jesus was a carpenter too. He, he was familiar with nails and hammers. He worked with these things his whole life. Now, when they nailed Jesus to the cross, they probably put the nail through his wrist and not his hand. The, the hand wouldn't have held up his body weight. It would have come right through the skin. And so they, they put it between some bones in the wrist strategically. And the crosses that they would have used, this is, this is kind of um, deceptive. We, the, the crosses that we see, the, the cross beam is down a little bit from the top. Probably the cross that Jesus would have hung on, the, the beam was up closer to the top like a T. Because they would, they would hang people up with their, their arms extended upward. Because this would help them to die faster. You, you're, you would normally die of asphyxiation. Your, your lungs wouldn't be able to breathe anymore. And so just the, the weight of your body would pull down and, and cause you to suffocate basically to death. But here's the difference. There's a difference between execution and torture. And what happened to Jesus is he was tortured. And here's how they tortured him. They put nail a nail through his feet or through his ankles. And, and so it was torturous because you wouldn't die as fast because you could push yourself up to breathe if you had something to push off of. And it would be incredibly painful to push off that nail, but you could at least come up a little bit to breathe. But Jesus went through incredible suffering. You've heard the word excruciating, excruciating. It just means the worst pain you could possibly feel. You realize that that word is a Latin word that means of the cross. You see the, word, the, the letters C-R-U, uh, C-I in there, crucifix, cruciform, excruciating, of the cross. And so they got to the place where they would crucify him and the soldiers shoved the carpenter to the ground. They stretch out his arms against the beams and one of the soldiers presses a knee against his forearm and a spike against his wrist. And we asked the question, couldn't Jesus have stopped all of this? I mean, he calmed storms, he fed the five thousand. Couldn't he have made, put an end to this? And the answer is absolutely yes. And so we ask a follow-up question. Well, why didn't he do it? Here's why. It's because it wasn't the nail that held him to the cross. It wasn't the soldier that held him to the cross. It wasn't the hammer. It wasn't the crowds. It wasn't Pontius Pilate. You know what? He knew how to work a hammer. He would have nailed himself to the cross. You know why? Because the nail didn't hold him there. It was love that held him there. It was forgiveness that held him to the cross. And here's the thing you have to remember is that between his hands and the wood, there hung something else on that cross. And it was a list, a long list. And it was a list of 
your mistakes and my mistakes and our lust and our lies and our greed and our weakness and our shortcomings and our shame and our careless words and our wayward thoughts. And Jesus says, I'll take that. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm going to nail it right here to this cross with me. But listen to this passage in Colossians 2. Paul says, God made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. Listen now. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So it says, God set aside our list of sins. The, the legal demands that go with being guilty. And he nailed it with Jesus to the cross. And so in addition to Jesus' wrist being nailed to the cross, so was this list of your sins. And here's the good news. Just like the hands of Jesus opened for that nail, the doors of forgiveness opened for us at the same time. So that we, remember those words? Here's the point. Jesus suffered so that we could have forgiveness. I'd love you to say that with me. Just say those words. Jesus suffered so that we could have forgiveness. Ready? Jesus suffered so that we could have forgiveness. You can even type it out in the chat if that helps you, just to see it. Type it. He suffered on the cross so that we could be forgiven. Well, around 10 a.m., Jesus on the cross said the words that we're all familiar with. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Then the soldiers started to gamble away his clothes and people started to mock him saying, if you're the king, save yourself. About 11 a.m., that, that, that Jesus had this conversation with the criminals on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He speaks to his mother and John at the foot of the cross saying, son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. Right around noon, something incredible happens. It says that darkness covered the whole earth, that the, that the sun, like literally like a light switch, turned the sun off. Pitch black in the middle of the day. Can you imagine that? Then around 1 p.m., Jesus says the famous words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he, he looks down and he says, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this vinegar that, that you got. Red wine vinegar, any kind of vinegar will do. We would, we're not being totally literal here. But I want you to open it up. And I just want you to, with whoever you're with or whatever, smell it. Just take a big whiff of it. If you're brave, put, put a little bit on your finger, pour a little bit on a small cup and just, and just take a sip of it. Put it to your lips, taste it. And I'd love you to just put a one word description in the chat, you know, especially kids or whatever, maybe kids give your parents a word, but what, what's one word that comes to mind when you smell that or taste that vinegar? What does it smell or taste like? Because here's what I want you to remember. Jesus said, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. And we find out what they did in John 19, 29, and 30. It says a jar full of sour wine stood there. Red wine vinegar, essentially. Vinegary wine. And it says they put a, a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it up to his mouth, and Jesus received the sour wine, and he said, it is finished. So right before he died, he received this, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Again, he's in total control. Jesus is the first person to not die by some other means. He gave up his spirit. He decided when he was dying. He had refused this wine or this sour wine before. It was a different kind of wine. It was one earlier that says that it contained gull, which means that it was a, it was a drug. It was like an anesthetic that would dull the pain. He, he refused that. But he took this wine on this hyssop branch. And this wine, this sour wine, was kind of a common drink at that time. It was a cheap replacement for water, and it actually served to kind of make the water taste a little better if you mixed it with water. But he was thirsty. He was thirsty. And here's what I want you to see. Jesus was thirsty so that we could be satisfied. Say it with me or type it with me. Jesus was thirsty so that we could be satisfied. He said to the woman at the well, he said, I'm the living water. And whoever drinks from the water that I'm, I'm giving, they'll never be thirsty again. So he was thirsty so that he could become the living water for us that he could satisfy. So as we think about the reasons that we call Good Friday good, it's because Jesus was betrayed so that we could have hope and that Jesus suffered so that we could have forgiveness and that Jesus was thirsty so that we could be satisfied so that we... But we're gonna move into a time now. You know, when, when someone close to us dies, that's what we're commemorating today. It's heartbreaking. 
And often the, the next holiday without them, we, we, we have an empty chair there at the Thanksgiving table or at the wedding. We, we were commemorating the fact that somebody's gone that, that should have been here. Well, imagine the disciples' next meal. They were very aware of the empty spot where Jesus was supposed to sit. So what I want you to do as we move into this next time is to just locate an empty chair near you. You don't have to do anything with it. Just find one. And I want you to imagine Jesus sitting there with you. We're going to prepare for this meal as the disciples maybe prepared for their next meal. And this meal of communion. It's a meal where we commemorate what happened here on the cross. That the broken body of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And remember that this is a so that we moment. So what I want you to do is I want you to prepare for communion. I want you to get the elements that you have with you. Maybe it's a, a loaf of bread. Uh, I got a nice big loaf of bread here that our son baked the other day. Loaf of bread, or maybe it's uh, some saltine crackers or a cookie, like I said, wherever you can find. Maybe find some juice. Got a little cup of juice here or sparkling water, whatever. But I want you to just to gather that up and whoever you're watching this with, however many of you are, would you begin to distribute that, uh, those elements right now to everybody around you? This is a, such a cool thing for a family to do together. And uh, our worship team is going to sing over us as we make these preparations. And so as you get prepared, as the song plays, would you just find yourself in a worshipful moment as we consider the body and the blood of Jesus. Let's worship together. Washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice! It saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory.
sing, oh, what love. Oh, what love. No greater love. Grace, how can it be? perfect song to prepare us for this time of communion. Um, we've got, uh, hopefully you've gotten set with some bread and some juice, something to eat and something to drink during this time. I just want to remind you that this is not necessarily how it's supposed to be. Um, we're supposed to be together. Communion represents this kind of communal table, one table, one loaf of bread, one cup, one spirit, one body. You know, you, you can imagine these, that the reason that we do this is to say that we're all together when it comes to the death of Jesus. And so here we are in our homes with different elements spread all over the place. And I think the Lord understands. I think he honors this time that we're going to spend together right now. And so what I'd like you to do is to hold those elements in your hand and we have a very special guest that I've invited to join us tonight, uh, Pastor Mike. Many of you know, if you've been around Grace a while, uh, he just retired this past year. But Pastor Mike and Annie are going to lead us through this time of communion. So be ready with your elements and uh, just follow Mike's uh, lead. Hey, everybody. Annie and I are delighted and thrilled to be able to share in this communion experience with you. And uh, just real quick, I just want you to kind of sit in these words for a moment from the letter to the Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So does he know what it feels like to go through what you're going through? Absolutely. Does he understand panic, maybe anxiety, wondering what's gonna happen to loved ones, what's tomorrow gonna feel like? Absolutely. Yet he did not succumb but he allowed himself to go through it. As a matter of fact, he was in the biggest pandemic that ever was or will be. 100% infection rate, everybody got it. 100% fatality rate, nobody made it through. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And there was no man-made solution. So God had to provide. And in a meal like what we're going to do right now, he revealed his antidote, his preventative, his vaccine. If you have uh, communion bread, why don't you grab it now and we're gonna to listen to Paul's instructions. I'll pray and then we'll eat together. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Oh, Lord, that image of you breaking the bread is graphic because, in truth, we broke you. You were uh, decimated on our behalf to push back the pandemic of sin and to provide a way to remove the sting and to give us a new life. And we thank you and honor you in Christ's name. Let's eat together. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, at his side, Holy Spirit among us, uh, this was your doing. We broke everything a long time ago in an ancient garden, and you provided, Father, your Son to substitute himself on our behalf, and his blood was shed when it should have been ours. So again, on this night, in this critical time that we're in, we thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did for us. In Christ's name, let's drink together. So, my friends, my family, let's remember, promises of God are ironclad. They're immovable. Jesus said, I will never, not sometimes, I will never leave or forsake you. So this evening, on through to next week, next month, next year, he's on point. We can trust him. God bless. Oh, thanks so much, Pastor Mike and Annie. So great to see you guys again and uh, to have you serve us in that way. Man, pandemic of sin, 100% death rate. Whew. Always drop these bombs, Mike. I just appreciate you, brother. So back to the story. We're at 3 p.m. The Bible calls it the ninth hour. Jesus is, is dead. The, the soldiers come and they pierce his side, showing that he's dead. But he, and he cried out. Remember, he just had said, you know, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But something else happened at this moment, at this ninth hour. The Bible says that there was an earthquake and then there was this huge ripping sound from coming from the temple. Now remember, it was pitch black. It was dark outside. The whole earth was dark. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine sitting at your office desk at, you know, two in the afternoon or noon and all of a sudden the light switch goes out on the whole world and it's pitch black. No sun, no moon, no stars, nothing. It's black. The Bible says the sun stopped shining. So, so what I want you to do right now is I want you to send somebody in your little group to just turn out the lights. You, you'll, you'll still have the glow of this little screen here, so you, hopefully you'll be able to see something. But ha have somebody turn out the lights in whatever room you're in. I want it to be as dark as possible. And just imagine it being pitch black. There's an earthquake across the whole earth. Stones are splitting into. And, and if somebody could take out the cloth or the newspaper, maybe a couple of you could grab it on one side or the other, because here's, here's what the Bible says. Don't, don't do anything with it yet. Matthew 27, 51 says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, and the earth shook. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. And so there was this curtain that hung in the temple. And it, what it did is it separated people from God. Only one holy man, one time a year, could go past the curtain. You couldn't go in there. And, and in order to go in, he had to bring a blood sacrifice. Well, what, what God is saying here is that the ultimate blood sacrifice has been made. And so this huge curtain, it was as thick as a wall. It, it, it stood for keep out. There's this separation between God and man. And it says that when Jesus died, this passage we just read said that this veil, this curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. Just to make clear, we know who did this. This was God's initiative. And the barrier was gone for good. And this was God's way of saying, this is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The way is now open for you to approach me. Now anyone who comes to God through the sacrifice of Jesus has open access. The barrier is gone for good. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to see. Jesus died so that, so that we could come in. That we could come into his family. That we could come into his table. That we could come into his kingdom. That we could come into his throne room with incredible confidence. And so I want you to grab that cloth or that piece of newspaper or whatever it is. I want you to get a little rip going. And I want you or somebody or a couple of you to grab one end or the other. I want you to rip it from top to bottom. Here we go all together. And when we do it, we want to say, we can come in or I can come in. The way is open for me to come in. The veil has been torn in two and God has opened up access to himself for all people. Praise God. Now, I realize that we're sitting there in darkness, or you are, I'm sitting in light, but you're sitting in darkness. 
And it's easy to sit in darkness and believe the lie that darkness wins. And here's what I want to remind you tonight, that even though we're gonna, we sit a little while in darkness, God eventually comes. And he says, the, the very first thing that he said from the beginning of time, he says, let there be light. He's been doing it for all of history. When you're dwelling in darkness, when some of you may be hiding in darkness in your sin, maybe we're all in a dark period right now with this coronavirus. I want you to remember that Jesus died in darkness on Friday. Jesus laid in a dark tomb on Saturday. And here's the good news. Kids, I want you to remember this. God isn't afraid of the dark. He steps into the darkness. The Bible says that in him there is no darkness. And into the darkest hour in history, God came and he turned on the light. And the light was the resurrection of Jesus. Now, there's a traditional Good Friday service that, that some traditions do. It's called a tenebrae service. And during the tenebrae service, like what we've just done, but there would be candles up front, and slowly as the service goes on, they would turn out, uh, blow out one candle after the other after the other till there's one left at the end, and then they blow that out, extinguish it as a, just a symbol of Christ's death, and that we will sit in darkness until Sunday. But here's, here's what we felt. We, we, we decided to kind of turn this tradition on its head a little bit because everybody's in a bit of a somber spirit this Good Friday already. And so we don't wanna end on a totally somber tone. We wanna give you a little bit of glimpse of hope. And so what we wanted to do today is to take that candle. And so if you have a candle, would you take it out and just get that candle ready and a, and a lighter. And what I'd love to do is instead of turning out all the candles by the end of our service, we wanna to come to the end of our service and light a candle. And we're going to light these just in a moment together. But I would encourage you that as we light them, in anticipation of the resurrection, the light that comes through Jesus, that you would allow this candle to stay lit through the whole weekend. Obviously, blow it out at night. But allow this candle to stay lit the whole weekend. And it's amazing the the darkness can't stand up to even the tiniest little bit of light. So I've got a special instruction at, at the end as it relates to these candles. So please don't get too sidetracked in lighting it and all that stuff. But, but even though Jesus died, I want to remind you that there's a reason we call this Good Friday. We call this Good Friday because Jesus was betrayed so that we could have hope. And Jesus suffered so that we could have forgiveness. And Jesus was thirsty so that we could be satisfied. And Jesus died so that we could come in, that we could have an entree into his presence. So what I want you to do is as this last song plays, one of my very favorite songs, I want you to light that candle as a, as a family or as an individual. And then what I want you to do as, you, as that candle burns in the, in the darkness, I want you to write something in the chat that God has taught you during this service tonight. It may not be anything that I said, it may not be anything that was sung, but, but he might have shared it with you personally, individually, in your own spirit. But would you just write that in the chat? Would you share it with all of us as we sit with our candles as a reminder of the hope of the resurrection? So worship team, would you take us? The cross has the final word.
great song oh, man it just it says it all Jesus put an exclamation point on his ministry by taking our sins upon himself all right so here's what I want you to do I'm going to ask you a favor if you will tonight uh, if you haven't already I would have somebody turn turn the lights on and uh, what I would love for you to do is the the candles that you have if you'd extinguish them only to, to light them again, because we want to let them burn all weekend. But if you'd extinguish your candle now, and do me a favor that after we get off this broadcast, if you would uh, come back together while, while you're with whoever you're with, or if your family's together, if you're by yourself, whatever, set up your phone or a camera and film yourself lighting the candle. Just very simply, or you, you know, if you have kids, have one of your kids light the candle or something, do it as a family. But, but film yourself lighting the candle, and then if you would... Submit that video tonight at whoisgrace.com forward slash Easter. I want to show you just a, a picture of what that website looks like. So you see that button there? You just click that button. It takes you to a very simple form where you can upload the, the video from your phone or your device or whatever. But would you submit that tonight? And I know last service that we got real busy and people had to do it a couple times. You have to sign in uh, to whoisgrace.com. But if, if you have to try it a couple times, please do that. We have something very special in store uh, for tomorrow as we lead up to Easter. But for now, let me just offer this benediction. Thank you so much for joining us on this Good Friday. What unique circumstances we're in. Uh, but we leave the story for now. Jesus has been taken down from the cross, his body has been laid in the tomb. And our candles burn with a, a flicker, a glimmer of hope. But we sit waiting and knowing that the new light of life is just around the corner. Sunday's coming, guys. Sunday's coming. And so we'll see you on Easter. God bless you. Thanks for joining us on this Good Friday.